In 1889, Copper King W.A. Clark and 74 other men wrote a state constitution to serve the needs of Montana's powerful interests with a weak governor, a secretive legislature, and special tax deals for the powerful. After 60 years under the copper collar, Montana was declared the nearest thing to a colony of any American state. The Anaconda Mining Company even owned most Montana newspapers, the Copper Press. The corporate dominance of Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. Seventy years after statehood, the Copper Press was finally sold and thousands of World War II veterans had been educated under the GI Bill. Newly enlightened Montanans wanted out from under the copper collar, and big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Changing Montana's constitution was the top priority. Strengthening the governorship, opening up the legislature, empowering citizens. Voices of Montana women, totally silenced in 1889, rang out loud and clear for these changes. When the Constitutional Convention began, 19 women were among the elected delegates. And when the delegates came together in convention, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, men and women, young and old, sat alphabetically as equals, Montanans just wanting to make their state better. And so they did, producing a Constitution for the ages, the last best constitution. Now at its 50th anniversary, Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time shine a light on the creation of this remarkable Montana Constitution. Welcome to Last Best Constitution. As you know, uh, this whole series is built around the 50th anniversary of Montana's Constitution, which uh, in early 1972 uh, was put together by 100 citizen delegates, uh, not elected officials at the time, but citizen delegates uh, who came in and were to craft a new document for Montana, a new fundamental document, after 83 years under the 1889 Constitution. And actually, as we have learned, uh, it was 83 years under the copper collar, if you will, as the initial Constitution we had. Uh, was crafted by the Copper Kings and the powerful economic interests of 1889 and was tilted in the favor of, uh, of uh, those powerful interests. So change was in the winds in Montana. Uh, people were looking at what can we do to make our government work better and work for us as citizens. And so uh, in that uh, era of change, a convention was called and 65% of the electorate in Montana said, Let's have a constitutional convention and let's take a what we, see what we can do to change the nature of our, our government and the relationship of our government to our people. Uh, uh, in that process, uh, the, the uh, Constitution started with uh, a lot of research on the front end. Uh, it wasn't a, a thing where th they opened the doors, walked in and said, let's figure this thing out. Uh, there had been two commissions that had been uh, uh, created the Constitutional Revision Commission and the Constitutional Convention Commission over a period of years and uh, in that period uh, uh, staff was engaged uh, which started the research and those that very wonderful staff prepared the path if you will for those hundred Montana citizens to be productive in the 54 days in uh, January, February, and March of 1972 when they put together the document that was later voted on later that year. Uh, so we're celebrating that 50-year anniversary in Montana right now and part of noting that celebration is to capture for you, the viewer, the Montana citizen, uh, uh, what happened and to hear it from folks who were there. And today we're welcoming Bruce Seavers. Uh, Bruce is, uh, uh, was the research analyst for the education article of the Constitution uh, and has a, you know, and there's a lot to talk about within this, Bruce, but welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, you nice know, uh, yeah, uh, I like to ask folks to understand who helped make this happen. And in your case, uh, 
you were on a, a very important article, of course, is, is in the education article, all the things that are in there. We'll get to those. But w what was your family history and background before you became a, uh, a, an employee of the mm -hmm. Constitutional Convention? Yeah, I was uh, actually born in Albuquerque, but we moved to uh, Missoula when I was six years old. So I did my whole uh, uh, elementary and secondary education in Missoula. Still consider myself a Montana. Well, in those days, there were only Spartans coming out. Were there were there uh, knights right. then or not? No, no just there wasn't Spartans. even a Hellgate, was there? No, this was Missoula County High School. Yeah, was it. yeah, yeah. So exactly. you were a Spartan, huh? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so tell us about. Uh, uh, so you 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 work your way through high school. Uh, uh, decided to do more with yourself, did you? <laughs> well, uh, I had always had an intent to go to college, and I ended up. <clears throat> Um, going to Stanford, I uh, uh, I always identified with the Grizzlies and and uh, yeah. and being part of the uh, university, what now is the University of Montana, what then was called Montana State. Montana University. State University, um, then, yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I had a real affinity there, but I uh, felt the need to to go outside of the state and just uh, you know get a different experience, and um, so I had a. Uh, a great time, but I'd come back in the summers. I, I actually, um, uh, when I went to university, I um, smoke jumped uh, for five years. So I was. Well, you were a smoke jumper. Yeah. Red skies over Montana. Uh, that's right. That's right. Filmed in Missoula. Actually. Yeah. Richard yeah. Woodmark. Was, yes. Yes. I remember um, the movie well. Um, so, anyway, I, I uh, you know had a very close association with with uh, with the. Town and with the with the state, I actually we actually um, when I was ten years old, we got a small place on Flathead Lake and uh, have had it ever since. Uh, so we, that's that's a kind of anchor for the family as well. So um, and my my parents were both um, actually engineers, in, which was kind of unusual for my mom, especially. And she was a civil engineer back in the she got her degree in the twenties, the nineteen twenties. And um, so there was always a lot of uh, emphasis on education and and, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 going to college and so forth, and that's and I followed that path. Um, so I had um, w when I was at the university, I, I actually ended up staying on to do graduate work at uh, at Stanford, and during that time. Um, Let's see, it was right, I guess just after I uh, graduated, but I was still writing my dissertation, um, I ended up working for Lee, Senator Lee Metcalf. I was, uh, Lee was known, Lee, Lee had a thing that we always called the Metcalf interns. That's what it was. And it was a great brotherhood and sisterhood yeah. of people who were extraordinarily talented who got a chance to spend a, a year in Washington, D.C., and you were one of, the, well, one of them. I felt very lucky to do that, yeah. I had. Uh, I had come back from, I was actually studying in Europe at the time, came back and applied for the Metcalf, Metcalf internship and, and was lucky enough to get it. And so I spent a year in Washington. That was a very formative time in my life as well. Worth noting that uh, you had a fellow Metcalf intern on the, as a delegate. Uh, Jerry Kate had been a... That's right. Uh, and then and, another uh, research analyst uh, after me, Roger Barber. Roger Barber also. Uh, so. Became, so Lee, Lee had a good, yeah, could pick good talent. It you know. was quite a, quite a group, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so you you uh, went to graduate school at Stanford. At Stanford, right. And then went in off, did some things in Europe uh, yes. as you were moving forward. Right. I uh, So I did part of my studies in Europe, but came back and got my uh, graduate degrees at Stanford. and So I ended up there the whole time, but um, again, connected, stay connected to Montana. Uh, and I was actually in back in Missoula uh, uh, writing, um, working on my dissertation. And um, my wife had been from Missoula as well, Joanna Lester, and she... Um, uh, we, we we were staying at her parents' house at the time, and somebody called up one day. It was actually I think it was Marjorie Brown who Marjorie was Brown, very yes. active. She was on the revision commission, right. and then later the the second commission. Right, and I think she was the one that called and said, you know, they're looking for somebody to be a staff member for the education committee. Might you be interested? I said, absolutely. This sounds great. 
So I um, ended up doing that. Uh, going in did you? Uh, did she turn you over to Dale or something, or what? How did you know? I'm, I was trying to remember that. I, I know I certainly met Dale along the way. I think I think that's what happened. That uh, she referred me to Dale, and then yeah. and then I got hired. As we often say, the Godfather of the Constitution yeah, is Gail yeah. Harris. Yeah. Dale was quite a force. Yeah. Yeah. So then he now. What was the timing of this? Because the, uh, she was again. You had the revision commission, yeah. and then you had the after the seventy one legislature when they decided to, they'd already passed the call. I mean, the, the right. people, 65% had voted right. in the 1970 election to have right. a convention. They created a bill that set up the election and yeah. the processes, and they had a commission, again, and Marjorie was on that commission. Right. Uh, uh, and that commission, immediately after that session, and in some cases before that, people had been starting to write research on the different elements of the Constitution. Right. Uh, I How believe, did you fit into that now? I believe, I was trying to remember the timeline, but I believe it was the fall of 71. Uh, would that be right, or well, the fall of 70? Uh, w well, the fall of 70, well, the election was in the fall of 71. Uh -huh. So actually, uh, the commission had been in place, so the research yeah. was going on the right. summer and fall of 71. Yeah, I think it was the fall, the early fall of 71 is when I came on board, and I was, I think I was mentioning that uh, I think I was one of the last ones hired, so we got our study done. We got our study started a little late and uh, and finished a little late, but we still did it in the six month time period, whatever it was. So we moved to Helena uh, at that time from Missoula and uh, just to work on the constitution, work on the constitution, work on the research. Mm -hmm. And right off the bat, you had been chosen to fill a need, which was the education right. article. Right. Uh, we didn't know who the commission, who the delegates were yet. Right. Uh, we would soon know that, but yeah. didn't know who the chairman was going to be. Uh, and you had to just start in. Right. And had prior to you being there, had any of the research been done, or were you starting from scratch? For for the education article, yeah. from scratch, yeah. Uh -huh. um, but fortunately, Dale and, and you know who, whoever else had been working on it had gathered some of the res research right. materials, like uh, getting all the other state constitutions, which was a really important piece for all of us to look at what, what other states had in their constitutions for, re relevant to that. Well, Such research in those days was not saying Google go something Google, up. No Google. No internet, no internet, no Google, no anything like that. No, our, our major piece of technology was the Xerox machine in the, uh, yeah. in the basement of the Capitol. We all felt like, you know, it was a huge privilege to be able to run down there and Xerox whatever we wanted. My recollection was there were not even faxes then. Uh, that's right. We I I, don't think we were. Faxes. I remember the primary, uh, the, the, the very primitive faxes when I went to work with Senator Melcher back in 1979, and yeah. how primitive the faxes were then. Right. Well, that was a decade beyond this. Yeah. So no faxes, no internet, uh, interlibrary loan. Right. That was that we did uh, that, but you know it was always slow. They take forever. It was some, some weeks to get there, and so, yeah, we felt. I mean, again, we felt privileged to be able to, to get whatever we could, but it was it was certainly not just tapping a computer keyboard and saying, you know, bring up whatever. Yeah, and so here you are. Uh, you have a certain amount of basic stuff they collected. They said, we've got to get the other states' constitutions. Right, right. And then it went from there, uh, uh, your research. Uh, so how, how did it turn out? I mean, you, I see a book here. Yeah. What's that about? This is actually the the research. That's the that we that's did. the study that emerged yeah. from all that research. Exactly. Yeah. Each each art, each committee, and each article had a had a separate study like this, and it was later printed like this. But now now determined to be an important scholarly work, that is now uh, preserved uh, not only on the internet but yeah. in yeah. printed form yeah. for anyone in the world to get. Right, yeah, I got this one from Amazon, so it's, it's available. Yeah. You can go on yeah. to Amazon and you can pick up yeah. Bruce's book. <laughs> well, that's great. You know, but it, it, it is the roots of what we, we, we ended up having for an education system in Montana. Yeah, um, um, yeah we felt, you know, we, th there were various topics that we felt that were important to cover and at least consider. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a research analyst, we weren't determining what went right. in the Constitution. 
but we kind of set the agenda to some degree. I mean, we, we, we were able to look at this uh, range of topics that, that seemed to fit under that, under that category. Well, you had, a, you had your role. Right. You know, I had the same role with the Executive Reorganization Commission two years before, uh -huh. where we sat down and researched it all and crafted something for consideration of the commission That's exactly. in that case, yeah. and then ultimately the legislature. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you, you, when you're in the middle of it, you, uh, you sometimes forget you're writing for someone else, but uh, ultimately the people that were elected made the decisions. That's right. We'd lay it, in these studies, we'd lay it out, uh, uh, here are some options for considering under this topic and under education. So if you want to, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But if you want to think about, say, the constitutional sta autonomy of the university, the constitutional mm -hmm. status, whether whether that should get into the Constitution or not. Some states have it, some states don't. Mm -hmm. We would look at that and then we'd make the arguments both sides, say if you wanted to include this, here's here's what you should put in. If you didn't want to, you know, here's the reasons. And then they knocked it around in committee until right. they worked out some words and, right. and so on. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so come, come November was the election. November of 71, it was an off year. Right. It was a special election. Yeah. Uh, there was nothing else. Well, the only thing else on the ballot was the sales tax, but uh, it was a, a piggybacked on that. But these, all of a sudden, people were elected. Yeah. Do you recall? Uh, were you just head down uh, when that uh, the November 29th came around and they met uh, to organize? Uh, were you able to even take a look and say what's happening over there? Or, or, Not uh, really. I mean, we we were so immersed in the in their work that uh, I think that was pretty much. Yeah, I mean, we were aware that that was happening, but we didn't have any real role in that. So uh, Leo Graybill was elected as the president, right. and the other, the vice presidents, were all selected over a couple of days, and then they took a almost two-month break mm -hmm. till about the 20th or 22nd of January, I think, uh -huh. and you started up. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you just kept plowing through the research? We were churning it out. You know, we had such a limited time. I mean, there was like... I forget what the deadline was, but uh, we, especially for myself, who started in the, like, uh, maybe September, <clears throat> maybe second week in September, something like that. And then we were on a deadline to get it, get the work done by the next, what, the next uh, spring, about six months, whatever it was, we, we yeah. spent uh, so, uh, churning out this work. Now, as you're doing that, when, when did, you had to work with the committee. Right. Uh, uh, when did you first, in your recollection, discover, well, who's on the committee and who's the chairman, who do I have to work with? Yeah, fairly, I think right after the <clears throat> election, I, um, I uh, met Rick Champeau, who was the chair. He was so the, after they selected the leadership in right. late November, right. probably in December. That sounds right. Uh, you were acquainted yeah. with suddenly a fellow walked in and said, oh, by the way, I'm the chairman of yeah, the education committee. Exactly. He was a community college teacher. Yeah. At, I knew him. In Flathead Valley, yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, he had been, he actually was the Democratic Party chairman up there. Ah. You know, there were 58 Democrats and there were uh, uh, 36 Republicans uh -huh. and there were six independents in the CONCON. -con. Mm -hmm. And of course, they did do the shared leadership Right. And sat alphabetically. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of heavy partisanship at right. all. No, we didn't feel that at all uh, in, the, uh, in the committee or in the research. That but I was uh, Rick was a college professor up yeah. there. <clears throat> and, right. Uh, right. Uh, so tell me about that first meeting. and then. So, well, you know, that's funny. I can't quite, I mean, I remember it was very cordial and I really, we got along very well. Uh, it was mm -hmm. a, I think, which was a real plus. I think that happened on most of the committees with the staff. Mm -hmm. There's a great work, collaborative relationship with between the staff and the <clears throat> and the delegates. Um, but yeah, Rick and I, you know, sat down and talked about the topics, what should be in this, and the kind of research that I was doing, and you know, what, what the options were, what I should focus on. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> and and then later on, I I did as time went on over the course of the next month, I guess it was. Um, I, I met the other members and had some conversations with them as well. But a lot of it was 
just Rick and, and I, uh, you know, trying to churn out the... You're structuring it for the committee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and you had an interesting group. Uh, Bill Burkhart was on the committee. And I know Dan Harrington. Mm -hmm. uh, did anybody mm -hmm. jump out in your memory uh, on that on that committee, or were they just all? You know, I'm, <clears throat> again, it's mostly Rick. I'm, I'm just trying to think um, <clears throat> of the others. Do you, do you have the list of the others who were there? Well, Robert Noble was the vice chair. Yeah. And uh, Dan Harrington was on it. Right. Woodmansey, he was a yeah, teacher. I do remember he was a teacher. Mansey. Harrington was a teacher. Right. Uh, obviously, yeah. Shampoo was a college teacher. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else was on there. Uh, I should have pulled the whole list down. But, yeah, I, I uh, was wondering whether I have it here, but I don't think so. Uh, but in any case, uh, you prepared all the stuff for them. Yeah. By the way, how many pages was that? It ended up being a kind of a tome, actually, like all of us, you know, we all... I always tell people, you know, they wrote a book for every committee. Yeah, it was 200 and... 200 53 pages. And if there was a competition for the book size, you know, uh, Rick, Applegate, Rick Applegate claims the, yeah. the championship, you know. He, he, got, the, he got the pound. <laughs> yeah. Pounded, yeah. Uh, but uh, no, we uh, we took it seriously. And, you know, it turned out I was just rereading this the other day. I hadn't read it for a long time. <clears throat> and thinking, well, you know, um, it's sort of a, like a dissertation. I mean, it's yeah. it, it covers, it's certainly covering a very specific set of questions, but um, it was a lot like uh, writing a, a PhD dissertation, you know, only crap. Which you'd it. already done, so. Well, I was, was doing it. Well, you were still doing it. Yeah, uh, yeah. right. Well, that's, well let, let's cover that briefly before, because right afterwards you finished with, uh, with this. You had a, I, I thought the group was very distinguished, and I've been proud to know them hmm. later, uh, in some cases at the time, but to know them later, and I think the, I think, uh, if you said we well, were going to give an award for a good talent search, you give say the Con Con researchers were a hell of a product of a great talent search. Well, I'm, I'm excluding myself, I mean, I would say that uh, it was a great group. I mean, just a, a kind of an amazing collection of people that just came together at that one time, you know, 1971, 72, um, and uh, the. The group has remained, remained good friends with each other, yeah. but they've gone on to do all kinds of interesting things. One of them was, uh, I think you probably mentioned it <coughs> already, and that is um, uh, Jim Grady, who yeah. wrote a novel that became a famous movie, Three Days of the Condor. And, yeah. and uh, Jerry Holleran was a, a terrific uh, journalist who worked yeah. for the Missouli, and I think, or Lee newspapers at least for a long time. And it was uh, and Roger Barber who ended up teaching it. And and, uh, and being uh, the the head of the University of Montana at Northern for a while. Yeah. And uh, right. uh, uh, and you know, uh, Rich Bechtel ended up being the federal state coordinator for Montana and Washington That's D.C. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Applegate was all over the map with yeah, amazing was, things right. he was doing. Right. Lots of uh, environmental you know, work. That, work. Again, a, a a really a really remarkable group. Uh, uh, what did you do? Now let's just Rick, let's take care of this, uh, uh, so people understand what we're who we're talking about here, and w why you brought so much to the table for that education committee. Uh, what did you do after you got done? Well, I finally, Con -Con? Uh, finished my uh, dissertation and, and got my PhD uh, in political science, political theory, actually, at Stanford, and then. Uh, uh, a couple of things. I was the founding executive director of the Montana Committee for the Humanities, which was um, there's yeah. one one of those in each state, and it's morphed into. Uh, oh, it's a pretty big it's, deal. I think yeah. it's called Humanities Montana, but it's a grant making right. organization right. that. that uh, they helped finance the previous series I did called "In the Crucible of Change," oh, which really? financed by the uh, Committee for the or Humanities Montana, as yeah. they call it now. Yeah. Uh, and so you were the first. Director of that, you yeah, put it together? I, yeah, I was the founding director of wow, that. Wow, cool. Right after I finished uh, doing the work on the, uh, yeah. the uh, <coughs> Constitution, I, um, yeah, they were, again, I just happened to stumble along to, into situations where they were creating something new and I was uh, lucky enough to be able to help start it up. So we uh, convened, in fact, a couple of our early board members for the Humanities Montana 
uh, had been uh, Con -con, Con Con members. members. Dave Drum was one. I became yeah, a good yeah. friend of Dave's. Yeah. And um, I think Earl Barlow at least was very influential in the Indian from the Indian perspective. Indian yeah. Perspective yeah. here, and he'd been involved, and he was a member, and so forth. So um, anyway, that was a. You did that for a little while. For a little while, for a couple of years, and then I actually went on, uh, went back to California, to do the same thing in California. I was the founding executive director of the California Committee for the Humanities. So, uh, oh, you went from the little pond to the big yeah, pond. That huh? was, that was, yeah, that was kind of interesting. The, the the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is the sponsoring right. entity for all of this, had a had a kind of notion that they would sort of test out the idea of how this would work in, in smaller states and then finally ended up doing it in the big states. So I ended up in both places. Yeah, yeah. How long do you do that? Uh, nine years, yeah. I expected, again, to have a kind of short tour, but I ended up staying there nine years. Uh, and then what'd you do? And then I went to uh, work for a private foundation that's a uh, Haas fund, uh, the Walter and Lee's Haas fund. That's the family that owns Levi Strauss has a big foundation in San Francisco. And so it was uh, continuing this idea of grant making and philanthropy, although, um, you know, it hadn't been what I had anticipated doing, but I uh, ended up uh, doing it partly because it, it was a chance to bring together uh, various strands of, of what I'd done in the past. Um, then he, as a person was, seminal on the development of our education article, uh, you ended up uh, teaching? Yes, and after that, well, I, all the time, I, I'd remain, I'd, I'd continue to have a kind of foot in the academic world, but I, so I was, I had been teaching and publishing uh, <clears throat> some academic kind of uh, material, but uh, then when I retired from the uh, Haas Fund in 2000, and when it was it, two, I guess, um, I uh, uh, was invited back to Stanford to to teach a course there, and actually until this year, just just wound it up this year. You've been doing that. Uh, I've been doing the same thing, yeah. Teaching, yeah. teaching part. Twenty time. years of that. Twenty years of that. You know, you really put your time in. I know. You know, I, are you going to retire? I, <laughs> I think that this year I'm thinking finally maybe for the third time. <laughs> I but mean, every year yeah. you're anchored back to Montana. Right, every year I come With back. With Flathead Lake yeah. you come back. And, yep, yeah, that's you know. where I'm headed right now. Oh yeah, well, mm -hmm. we're all gonna be envious of wow. that. Of that's, that. that's a great, it's one of the great spots of the world yeah. for sure. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the education article. Sure. And uh, uh, some of the things in it. Uh, uh, in the broader picture, uh, the constitutional language is important when it speaks about the, uh, essentially the state of Montana being required to pro provide a, a, quality, a quality public education right. for everyone. Right. Uh, tell me about how that got in there and, and whether it was discussion or debate about it or. Yeah, uh, yeah. well again, that, <clears throat> that was one of the kind of um, uh, standard items that occurs in most state constitutions. Right. It's something that refers to the state's obligation to provide a uh, 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 quality education and so forth, but it became um, uh, clear to us that there was this uh, tension between the idea of providing a quality education, which is which is a challenge to well, one thing to find, and mm -hmm. the second thing is to make happen. Um, so, but we realized that that really was uh, an important piece that should be in a constitution and. That the um, the tension was with what though was uh, it? between quality and equal. So okay. the, that was the other okay. piece. Okay, equal uh, and quality. That, yeah. yeah. So so that it should be uh, uh, an aspiration of, of the state to to provide uh, quality education and to um, to make sure that it was equally provided and to try to do both of those at once is a huge challenge in terms of funding and so forth because. You know, everybody would love to have the best education possible, but uh -huh. you you know, making it happen is is another thing and with limited resources. And Montana had a long history of a very scattered, decentralized local school system, as it would one would imagine, because it, uh, you had to 
provide these schools uh, to districts all over the state. There are something, I think, even close to 250 or something like that, yeah. school districts in the state. Some as few as five, five uh, families or five people. Um, well, that's if you got local educational control, that's what exactly, happens, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> the idea was, you, how do you do that and still maintain quality? Mm -hmm. And Montana's always strived to do that. And of course, that was interfaced with the financing of education had developed so that it was predominantly local, local money. Right, that was that. It was a local based system. based on property tax. Right, which, which meant obviously huge discrepancies between uh, rich areas that, that, that was, you know, had lots of economic. And that isn't necessarily rural urban. For example, no. you got a lot of tax base in Missoula, which yeah. is houses and stuff. Right. But places with industrial tax base exactly. often had, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example, coal strip. Sure. Was a, about that time when they were building the coal strip plants, right. they had this huge tax base. Right. And so they could have a real low tax rate right. and still collect so much money for their education exactly. so and that caused some real discrepancies. Exactly. So the question was, how do you equalize that? Well, that, right about that time, actually, there was a famous case in California um, brought, that was brought about the same sort of problem in California, so the discrepancy between high wealth and whole wealth, low wealth districts. And uh, it went to the the California Supreme Court and got decided as in the Serrano versus Priest case, which was, you know, sort of set the tone for what was going on nationally. Um, <clears throat> that that it w that it was essentially at least California ruled in terms of their constitution. It was illegal to have that kind of discrepancy. So they it meant uh, gravitational pull toward. Um, uh, state more state funding for the for education rather than local tax base, um, and so the idea was you kind of you would create a system where you'd pull tax money into the state and then that would distribute it redistribute back it to the districts in in a more equal way. So uh, we call that what equalization? Yeah, school equalization exactly. funding. Exactly. You know, there are a lot of statutory stuff on that every year. Yep. The leg every other year when the legislature meets. They yeah. have to grapple with uh, with the way that's done, right. but essentially, it's constitutionally pretty much required yeah. because uh, of the disparities. Right, exactly. So, uh, if somebody's got a huge taxes, you take mm -hmm. some of that, right? The, say the certain percentage of the mills, right, and you capture them from every community in the state, right. put them into a pot, and, then you and send them back out. And if you're from a poor area, you get a little of that money from coal strip. Yeah. to help elevate the, exactly. your, your ability to do education right. uh, locally. Right, yeah. and it, it, that interfaces with the, the issue of school size as well, because one could say that it's obviously uh, less efficient to have smaller right. schools. So um, this, this allows you to compensate for that, to give, you know, even in places where there are small schools that are scattered mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. uh, that you're able to uh, provide them with some resources. So uh, uh, guaranteeing a uh, equal education, a quality education, uh, financial educa uh, uh, equalization. Now, we're, in all this stuff, we're talking about uh, what we would say K through 12. Right. Uh, That's uh, right. Now maybe it's even more than K through 12, but that's basically what we're talking about, that right. kind of public education. That's right. Uh, that's right. Which uh, is uh, different from uh, higher education. Right. Uh, uh, in Montana, uh, one of the things you guys took up was, uh, in the education article, was the university system. Right. And uh, tell us about yeah. uh, that. Well, there was certainly Pretty much, I think, unanimous concern on the committee, and I, it was shared by the other delegates as well, um, for uh, to make sure that the university system could operate independently and not be interfered with politically. Uh, Minimize uh, political yeah, interference with right, the... Exactly. And I think there was concern about that. There was concern nationally about it, but it was con there was a special concern here. The question was, uh, how, what could you put in a constitution that would help protect the university from that kind of interference? And um, 
Now, before we talk about the mechanism, this is real stuff. Uh, in Montana history, yeah. in the around 1920 or so, at the University of Montana, a professor named Louis Levine wrote a book, and the book was about who pays taxes in Montana. Mm -hmm. And his book revealed that the Anaconda Company had managed through the old constitution to avoid the taxing of the proceeds of mining mm -hmm. so that their taxes for people, they were the biggest entity in the state, but their taxes, yeah. not surprisingly, were way down here. Right. And when he published the <coughs> book, he got fired. Mm. He got fired. Yep. And then it was such a fuss raised over it, they, hired, they, they felt they compelled to hire him back. He came back briefly and said, I'm out of here. I don't want to have to deal with this stuff. Yeah. And off he went to Michigan. Right. But that's real stuff sure. that they had oh, to yeah. grapple with. So, yeah, so how, how, did the, how did you guys or the, the, the delegates deal with that? So we looked at all the other states' constitutions. And, and again, this is just a process of research of finding out where the strongest Statu st strongest provisions were in state constitutions. And we found there were two or three, actually two that were especially prominent, and that is California and, uh, and Michigan, which happened to have two of the best state, uh, public university systems in the country. Had Maybe the, that's why Louis Levine went to Michigan. Is that, yeah. is that where it went? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Um, but um, they, so, uh, it was felt that the, you know the, those were states, two states that had the, the provision in the constitution that the university should be autonomous, more or less, I more mean, control, not a not a fourth branch of government, but but pretty you know pretty insulated from uh, political control, and um, so we we kind of copied that that uh, language, and that's what ended up in the Montana Constitution. Uh, let's see, where are we in here on that? That would be the uh, uh, State University. That's, let's see here what it says. Yeah. Um, Essentially, what it said, it granted uh, management and control right. to the Board of Regents. There it is, Boards of Education, that's right. At the same time, when the, con in, in 1972, before the Constitution was changed, uh, there was um, one single school board that oversaw the uh -huh. elementary and secondary and the university. And I think part of the feeling was that was really inappropriate because there's such such different kind of agendas for both of those uh, kind of institutions. So there should be two separate boards: one that mm -hmm. is a public school board and one that was a university regents. And um, then um, here it says the government and control of the university, Montana University system is vested in the Board of Regents, which shall have full power, responsibility, and authority to supervise, coordinate, manage, and control the Montana University system, and shall supervise and coordinate other other public in educational institutions as assigned by law. So, uh, a pretty straightforward yeah. statement, and which, by the way. Uh, uh, comes under constant, there's a friction between the legislators sure. and money and the university right. control, uh, which goes on every year. Yeah, and it's inevitable. I mean, and in some ways, you know, there's, there's a balancing act there, too, because it, the sense was, well, the university can't just have complete right. reign over because, you know, it's not a taxing body and so forth. So it has to be supported by tax money. If that's happening, it's going to be there's going to be some element of control by the legislature, but uh, but the um, but the, but in terms of subject matter and universe and so forth, uh, that should be a autonomous. Uh, Tell me, did uh, uh, did that uh, issue uh, generate much uh, heat on the floor of the convention or in the committee? You know, it's interesting. Uh, there were some issues that did, but that one not yeah. so much that I remember that where there was real controversy. I mean, it was a sense that there was a kind of Shared sense that it was important for the, excuse me, the university to have um, have control over its subject matter and have academic freedom and not not be subject to political whims. Uh -huh. And that played out, by the way, right afterwards, 
uh, there was a creation in the implementation of this provision was the creation of the Office of a Commissioner of Higher Education right. and a central office for the university system. Mm -hmm. uh, that was more leg of a legislative vehicle, but nonetheless, uh, yeah. and immediately in the next legislature, uh, uh, the legislature tried to uh, carve into the authority of the regents, and they had to go to the Montana Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, in, yeah, I've, I've, I understand there have been several Supreme Court cases around those issues. Uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, they're going on right now. Yeah, even. right. But it was regents versus a judge, which they were, it was a ju governor judge was, mm -hmm. the legislature had gone home and they didn't, who are we going to see? So <laughs> we'll just sue the governor. <laughs> and he wasn't really at fault in it, but he got the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. But the Supreme Court laid it out very clearly that uh, the Constitution meant what it said. Yeah. So that is held, mm -hmm. although there's constantly that friction. Right. And... Uh, well, having it in the Constitution as opposed to statute yeah. um, makes a huge difference because it gives it gives the regents an ability to say, "Look, you know, if you if you have to if you want to change this, you got to rewrite the Constitution. You can't." Yeah. You can't so that's been a strength for our university system yeah. for sure, uh, for the board of regents. A uh, recent example was in this last legislative session, yeah. where you know, of all the things you want to think you want to argue about, of course is, you know, they always say that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, but what's really worth fighting over in the West is guns. Yeah. And, uh, and, and some legislatures p passed, even though they knew it was unconstitutional, mm. they passed a provision that said guns have to be allowed at free on campus. Yeah. And the regents had had a 30-year policy that we don't allow guns on campus. Right. It's not a good thing. Yeah. And uh, that is now before the courts, although I think the, I don't think there's any question how the courts are going to, act on that. Yeah, I would hope so. I mean, that, that's a great example because, I mean, it's, it's, it's true somebody could say, well, there's a Second Amendment right to carry, but the fact is uh, there's still an ability to control by wh whatever bested body, which in this case is the Board of Regents, what goes on in their campus. And, yeah. and, and you know, that's a, a, a beautiful case, I think, because it does not involve the money side. Right. Where the legislature says, well, yeah, but we want to manage exactly. the money. Yeah. That was pure policy. That was pure management. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think of you know, I, I when I teach my university classes, I can't imagine. You know, I teach political theory, and I can't imagine having a class full of people sitting there with guns on their heads. Yeah. I mean, it's a little, <laughs> little, little yeah. strange. Yeah. Now let's talk for a minute about the financing of uh, of public schools again. Yeah. Let's go back to the land trust. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, lands, in the Constitution here in this section says all the public lands of Montana, owned by the state of Montana, mm -hmm. any revenue from them is dedicated to a trust fund, which is for education. Right. I believe, yeah. yeah, that's right. And uh, that's a big source of money for state-level yeah. money for education. Yeah, again, I think it was an attempt to try to change that sort of local, local funding base that it had, that it, uh, uh, had, had, had the inequal, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think the, the, the idea was that you know, it would using the public lands money to do this w is would be a way to uh, get money directly th to the state that could go to the schools that didn't have to be uh, churned back like the other, yeah. to, uh, taken from the local and then come would return back some of that some of the funding for the schools does come that way but now those lands and any revenue from them any revenue at all from them right. is dedicated to public education right. and they're under the you in this article created we, we're all familiar for other, other reasons with the state land board yeah but it was really created to manage the lands for education right all five top uh, state elected officials are on that land board. Yeah. And, and, and they end up doing permitting for things mm -hmm. and, and very controversial <clears throat> stuff. Should we have a mine there? Shall we have this yeah, or that? Right. But ultimately, that's tailored toward how do we get revenue for education? Yep. Yeah. That's, 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 it's a challenge for a state like Montana to generate sufficient resources, and that's a way, one way to do it. And uh, they... Uh, actually are required to maximize the return yeah. on the land. Yeah. 
they can't give a sweetheart deal, yeah. or at least they're not supposed to give a sweetheart deal right. to somebody, yeah. and not get the revenue we need for education. Mm -hmm. But it has. I think that was a, a fortuitous uh, way mm -hmm. to look at it, and it mm -hmm. take the because there's so much public lands in Montana. Right. Uh, right. But uh, one of the con uh, things that uh, right now happens is there's controversy. For example, if you're leasing some public lands for oil. Uh, what are the royalties going to be on it? Mm -hmm. And uh, cases can be made where uh, people are paying way less yeah. uh, uh, than they should be paying, or way more. An interesting thing is in Montana, uh, because of the Board of Regents and all the requirement of the Constitution, if you have a federal oil lease, uh, your royalties, and what you have to pay if you're an oil company is a lot less than you have to pay uh, the if, in, for the state. Yeah. Uh, and then there's always the argument of how much mm -hmm. can you charge for grazing cattle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the, so this, is, this gets down to the basics, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. But, but yeah. they, again, are obligated to maximize that return. Yeah. And yeah. it creates a kind of, again, one of those tensions between incentive to generate money yeah. and the protection yeah. of the land. Yeah. Let's talk for a second about the sectarian prohibition mm. in here. Yeah. Yeah, that generated a lot of heat in the convention. Um, <clears throat> I remember quite well the hearings we had and so forth on it. Um, that had been, there had been a, Montana was one of those states in, in the early days and the, when the first constitution was written. Yeah, the 89 constitution was written in a period where that was right. a pretty common thing. You right. know, that was, but it was very, but there was a very a strong provision in the state, in the, 80, in the 89 constitution. And it was it essentially uh, carried over carried over into the 1972 Constitution. Yes, that there should be uh, clear separation. It goes back to the old battle about the, the separation of church and state and mm -hmm. the, the wall of separation that was described in early Supreme Court cases. And then that has evolved over time. So it's 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 uh, it's, it's 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 involved a, a bunch of complicated legal issues. Back and forth. Yeah, I see where it says that the uh, uh, legislature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, shall not make any direct or indirect appropriation right. or payment of any public funds or monies mm. or grant of fund, lands or other properties for sectarian purpose exactly. or to aid any church, school, academy, <coughs> seminary, college, university, or other literacy or scientific institution right. controlled whole in whole or in part by a church, a sect, or a denomination. So it was basically. Uh, if you you can't take religious schooling right. and take public money and ascribe it to it, it, with the exception, I believe, of pass through federal money. Yeah, some of the, well, yeah. that 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 yeah, that gets. I think somebody uh, added that kind of right at the end yeah. to kind of maybe save <laughs> the issue. Uh, yeah, I think in part. Um, the the other part part that this overlaps with that it's not identical is just non-public education in general. So. In the research we did, we talked about those two issues as being parallel and overlapping but separate. That is, whether public money could be spent on any kind of pri private education. Yeah, a private, say, private charter school, school yeah. as opposed to a public school. Exactly. As not, a, just, uh, not necessarily uh, religious. Exactly. So the religious gets into church-state issues, which is First Amendment issue, questions nationally. But the public, non-public is a real state issue and has to do with a determination about whether, you know, to what degree public public money could be used for private schools. And the, again, there are arguments on both sides. The private side would say, well, look, we're taking the burden off public the public institutions by providing education, which we, otherwise, otherwise the public would have to provide. Um, and the, uh, on the, on the other side is that, well, well, if you want to enjoy the benefits of public schooling, send your kids to public schools and don't send them to private schools. So, uh, yeah, well, it is an interesting because it, the the prohibition is very clear on religious right. private schools that are religious, exactly. but a private school that's not, the right. language is not nearly so clear. Exactly. Uh, and there's a rub in that too that yeah. happens depending on the... Exactly. Uh, uh, I've heard some delegates say, "I wish we'd have had the language just as firm on the on, on private non-sectarian right. schools." Yeah, no, some some definitely would say that, and that, that there's a public system, 
And again, one of the arguments for that is that, you know, that uh, education is one of the ways we create citizens. We encourage right. people to become uh, civic. And you, and you can be any citizen of Montana is poor, whatever right. location you're in, whatever your economic status, you get an edu right. our equal education <coughs> uh, provides that. Exactly. And it's a leveling of the society to right. that on not only the privileged get something, but everyone does. Absolutely. And so let's spend our money in that go right. toward that goal. Exactly, yeah, which is, uh, that is the argument on that side, but you're right. That specific question did not get Put into the Constitution. Yeah, it was not resolved, yeah. and which, at least partially related to the Espinosa case recently, mm -hmm. where we had a <clears> bit <throat> of an erosion here by into the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. Uh, that seemed to say it was okay to take. Uh, they were using tax credits. It was yeah. kind of a weird little thing, but yeah. it's a slippery slope yep. that we're always you know, looking it's at. A, it's a difficult issue to, to sort out. You know what? Where the uh, where the where parents can uh, draw in some way on public money to be able to uh, educate their kids in a, in a non-public school. Um, and, you know, again, we, we go back and forth between the arguments that uh, you could say, well, again, they sh if, it's, if it's public education, it should be under the public system. And the, if it's not, they shouldn't get supported with public money. But then, they, as you say, they are taking a burden off the public system mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. uh, educating the kids. So, yeah. yeah, I'll tell you. Well, that's, that's quite the thing. Let's let's uh, let's hit one more subject before we wrap things up. It's sure. a pretty important one, which is uh, uh, the cultural importance of Indian our Native Americans in Montana and Indian mm. education. Talk, talk, yeah. talk about that. Well, that's an issue that you know had lingered sort of in the background, <clears throat> but there was a, an awareness that uh, that there were that there was you know historical deficiency in what had been provided for Indians for Indian education, or not Indian, just Indian education, education in general, and so <clears throat> um, there were. Um, couple of presentations to the committee and maybe to the convention as a whole I can't remember by a couple of representatives of, of uh, young in uh, a couple uh, of young Indian, Indian women yeah, exactly came students so. right they made a really powerful uh, uh, pitch and I think there there was a sense of the, the delegates in general that that was true that, there, that Indian education had been uh, sort of neglected in, in uh, in Montana, and that there should be some provision that specifically recognized the importance of that community and their culture, um, and um, they. So the, the 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 way it got written into the Constitution was that you know we it's in right up there up. Uh, the Bill of Rights yeah, first, right? Yeah. Well, it was it was a question of whether it should go in the Bill of Rights. I think the way it got put into uh, the education article is that the state recognizes the, <clears throat> the distinct and unique cultural her heritage of, of the American Indians and is committed in its educational goals to the preservation of their cultural integrity. So it was a specific recognition of that, recognition of that group that had been kind of left out in so many ways in, in, the, in the educational system and in the general culture. And that that should they, they should get some special recognition. What has happened since then that we didn't talk much about at, in, at, in, the, convention, in the, committee, yeah. at the convention was the that this could be applied to uh, making sure that the education the population as a whole in Montana, I mean the, the school population, was exposed to history and cultural uh, mm -hmm. issues from the American Indians, and that. That has been, I think, a wonderful, in my view, uh, sort of unanticipated, excuse me, unanticipated consequence of um, the that that provision in the Constitution. Yeah. I understood that the the young ladies, the young girls, mm -hmm. uh, came and testified first before the Bill of Rights Committee, no, that, and that, they wanted to have true. some written in a Bill of Rights about the rights for Native Americans for education and other things yeah. and that cultural recognition and there's some under the dignity se uh, section it has uh -huh. got some uh, uh, recognition of that uh -huh. and then 
they uh, they said, you know, why don't we take you over and meet with the education committee? Right. And over they came mm -hmm. to meet with you guys. And by the way, it's a marvelous story about how a couple of young people decided yeah. to do something yeah. and it ended up having great import for the state of Montana for Absolutely. years. Well, forever, as long as we have this constitution right. in place. Yep. And uh, now it evolved into a, uh, uh, an Indian education for all. It, it, but, you know, like so many things, it didn't happen right away. Right. Here you have a constitutional thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it took years, decades for it to be implemented. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which yeah. goes to show you the power of the legislature, either by action or inaction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I and think it wasn't until the 1990s that they actually passed a bill that said we need to have Indian education. And they, again, made it, it wasn't just to educate Indians. They had that right. Right. Under the equal opportunity thing and 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 even though they were in t areas without much property taxes uh, yeah. uh, but they had the right to the education yep. but what they did is say mm -hmm. we need Everybody. given the cultural uh, recognition and the d individual dignity in the uh, right. sections of the Bill of Rights we, we want to make sure that we here in Montana understand the yeah. Native American culture right so we're going to not just uh, develop histories and all yeah. this stuff. We're going to make sure Montanans at every school uh, learn this. And Precisely. I remember coming back to Montana <clears throat> sometime around in the 90s uh, and hearing the governor say he just signed uh, uh, this is he was making a speech to some group and I was there for whatever reason and uh, was, he was very proud of the fact that he just signed into law this provision that, that uh, allowed the, uh, the entire educational system to get a dimension of Indian uh, culture. And, and it wasn't until even uh, a number of years after that that there was actually money put in it because yeah. you created a statute that said we got to have Indian education for right. all, then they have to appropriate right. the money. Right. And it was actually when Governor Schweitzer took over in 2005, and I was in that administration, yeah. that that the actual appropriation took place. Really, that's and, interesting. And, yeah. uh, and he was happy to sign that appropriation yeah. as he opened the doors of the Capitol to native Montanans. Yeah. It, was a, it, was, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, any reflections further on, your, uh, on, the, on this role, on the, uh, on the members of the committee? Anybody stand out besides Rick or? Uh, uh, Rick would be the primary one that I remember as being somebody, you know, who really shepherded this along and, was, and did a very nice, nice job of it. I mean, he incorporated, I think, some very good progressive items into the, into the Constitution. <clears throat> was very um, skilled in terms of dealing with his committee and in terms of the, 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 um, the convention as a whole. And um, I. So my, my primary recollections with, would be with Rick, but I think I'm sure all the committee members, you know, had mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. significant role to play. And Rick was very sensitive. If somebody had a concern or objection that, that they thought should be attended to, he would, he would uh, deal with that. One of the, one of the issues that uh, is sort of amusing to think about now, um, and that is one of the discussions we had was the st was the structure of the uh, of the uh, uh, administration of the, the the whole administrative system and um, w one of the possibilities would have been to make the state superintendent of schools subject to appointment by the board of uh, oh, the school board. But instead, you kept instead it elected. We kept it elected, and the reason was I found out later. Uh, was that uh, the ex the current the current uh, superintendent had, was so well liked? Well, she was pretty adamant about it too. And she was, and adamant. you couldn't afford the opposition. Exactly. For, well, you know, our time has rapidly run out. It's been really amazing to talk to you and get your firsthand experience and about this. It's been a real pleasure, and uh, uh, we're happy Montanans will see how how it was all made in the room. You know. And for the rest of you, we'll see you at the next episode. Mm -hmm.